lot. And thank you for joining us online. Um, can you hear my voice clearly? All very good. Okay, great. So uh, Dr. William, uh, we will be having uh, approximately uh, 50, uh, we are expecting 50 participants to be online in a few minutes time period. Uh, th the session will be starting at 8, uh, 7.30 Pakistan time and from your time it would be 9.30 a.m. And uh, I really hope that we will have a good uh, discussion on your topic. So we will wait for the next uh, five minutes more and then I'll give a small introduction of yours and then you can start your presentation. Okay, thank you.
Uh, shall we start, Dr. William? All, all set. Okay, so um, let me give a brief introduction of yours. So I welcome everyone uh, on today's uh, uh, lecture, which is uh, to be given by Professor William Rosenblatt. Dr. William is the Professor of Anesthesiology at Yale. And uh, his uh, two most significant contributions in our field are on the airway approach algorithm and uh, pre-operative endoscopic airway examination. Dr. Uh, William is also the past president of Society for Airway Management and the current member for the American Society of Anesthesiologists Task Force on the Difficult Airway. So I really uh, am grateful to you, Dr. William, for joining us today online and uh, uh, giving us the talk on uh, the current guidelines on difficult airway from the perspective of American Society of Anesthesiologists. Thank you so very much. And uh, you can uh, please start your talk now. Great, thank you, Dr. Salam. And, and uh, thank you to the um, PSA Karachi for, for the invitation. And, um, something that you just said was very important, and, and um, that is that it is perspective of the difficult airway from the American Society of Anesthesiologists. And one thing that, that I appreciate, that, and many others um, in the society appreciate, that the approach to the difficult airway varies not only among uh, clinicians, but uh, culturally also. And so what I'm going to speak about today doesn't always translate outside of uh, North America. And I appreciate that. And by no means do we feel that this is the right way to, to look at difficult airways. We have to look contextually within a particular practice group, group and within a particular clinician. Clinician. Sorry, very... sorry. The, your voice is constantly distorted. Can't hear clearly. You can't hear me clearly? Uh, I think uh, the problem is with the participants' Wi-Fi because I can hear you. No, I can't hear you. It's very, uh, your voice is breaking. Uh, yeah, you... so you have to reconnect uh, because we can hear him very uh, clearly. Uh, yes, uh, Professor, uh, you can please carry on. Okay, thank you. So again, that is appreciated that it's going to vary not only among societies, um, medical cultures, but on top of that, it's gonna vary by the individual. And I'll, I'll emphasize that, that two individuals practicing in the same context may approach an airway very differently. And, and that is appropriate. That is appropriate that we, we approach an airway in regards to our training, our experience, the equipment we have available to us, and also what help, what aid we have available to us as we're taking care of a patient. And, and we'll go over that actually several times as I go on. So again, thank you for the invitation. Um, I do have some conflicts of interest. I just want to bring out that is I'm a consultant, uh, not, not paid, but I'm a consultant for both the Teleflex uh, Corporation and also the Ambu Corporation. And then I have my own teaching system which is uh, Airway on Demand, where we do programs for a variety of practices around uh, the United States and actually around the world, especially in, in the Americas, but, but around the world. So I was very fortunate that in 2022, actually in 2019, I was asked to join the task force for the uh, management of the difficult airway from the ASA. And this is the, the task force. These are the individuals who were invited to participate in, in this effort. And as you know, this is an effort that's been going on since truthfully 1988. And the task force has varied over that time with some individuals who've been throughout the entire history of the ASA task force and guidelines have participated in it. And in fact, Rick Connors. Jeffrey Affelbaum and Karen Hagberg have participated in the production of the ASA guidelines since 1988, or probably more accurately, 1991 is when the first guidelines were produced. Several of these groups included individuals who had taken uh, part in previous guidelines writing. We had two very interesting individuals in this task force, and that were 
methodologists, Rick Connis and uh, Medulica, were both PhD doctorate level methodologists who were full members of this task force. So it wasn't just clinicians. We had five intensivists. We had two physicians who were in private practice in the United States, a pediatrician, John Fiaggio from Harvard, and then several clinicians who also have administrative roles. So they're not just clinicians, but they also have administrative roles in their hospitals. We felt that was very important. Content experts, and I'm, I'm included among the content experts, those of us who teach and write and practice difficult airway management, and then several of us who also had been leaders of society for difficult airway management, such as Dr. Salam mentioned, I had been president of the Society for Airway Management, as most of these individuals, many of these individuals had also participated in Society for Airway Management. I want to talk to you briefly about the history of what the ASA Difficult Airway Guidelines are. How did it come to development and now 30 some odd years later that it still continues? In 1984, the ASA president was a gentleman, uh, Dr. Ellison Pierce. And what Dr. Ellison Pierce was confronted with was lawsuits, litigation against anesthesiologists. And this was disproportionate compared to other specialties in medicine in the United States. And in fact, it was increasing and the premiums, that is the money that we pay to, you know, to our insurance companies for medical legal coverage was also increasing at that time. And so he brought together a, uh, a group that started something called the Closed Claims Project. And the Closed Claims Project did exhaustive analysis of these litigations against anesthesiologists. And it included physicians and lawyers and actuaries and accountants who all looked at the areas that we were hurting patients the most. And these were the areas that doctors were getting sued in. And they were looking for patterns of both rare and serious events that were happening to these patients and use those for the basis for calling for guidelines. Now, all those events that were in this database were not just related to airway management. In fact, primarily they were related to spinal anesthesia. That was the area that most patients were being harmed and suing doctors for. But on top of that, they found airway management was a very significant cause for litigation against anesthesiologists. So a task force was brought together in 1989. And in 1993, as many of you are probably aware, there was publication of the first ASA guidelines along with the ASA algorithm. Now, there are many criticisms of this guideline, many, many criticisms of the algorithm that we'll, we'll talk about those criticisms soon. But the one thing that I ask you to recognize is that it was the first time that there had been guidelines and an algorithm for management of the airway. And so again, it was unique. It was a brand new concept. And even though there's a lot of criticism, I give tremendous credit to Dr. Pierce and to this group that included Dr. Affelbaum, Dr. Hagberg, and Dr. Connors that we met a moment ago for coming out with these first guidelines. Now, it was recognized over time that we needed to move these guidelines forward. And in uh, 19, uh, 2003, and then again in 2013, there was revision of these guidelines. Now, something very interesting happened in 2000. And three, whereas the original guidelines from 1993 were not evidence-based, they were primarily opinion-based, the guidelines published in 2003, 2013, and 2022 are evidence-based guidelines. Not necessarily the algorithm, but the guidelines themselves are evidence-based. And once again, that was kind of a, a vanguard of looking at guidelines. Well, what are practice guidelines? Practice guidelines and, and how are they meant to be used? And they're developed by something called the Committee on Standards and Practice Parameters at the ASA. Guidelines 
are used for decision making. They are, they are not necessarily required for clinicians to follow, but really they're recommendations for making decisions on taking care of any patient and for taking care of various practice issues, not just airway. Uh, the American Society of Anesthesiologists has published many, many guidelines over the years. It is considered that clinicians will vary from the guidelines in their practice, and that's okay because the judgment of the responsible clinician is very important to use of these guidelines. The development is based on a rigorous process that takes both opinion of the task force and of advisors to the task force, and as I mentioned before, the evidence-based uh, science. They're recommendations. They're not supposed to be you know, standards of practice or minimum requirements. And the interpretation of those, those guidelines take place within the local institution. So that one institution, here I am at Yale New Haven Hospital, there may be a different practice in another part of the United States based upon the guidelines, but what happens in the institution is very important. For, I'll give you an example. In this institution, we're using a lot of high flow nasal oxygen, Thrive in the operating room, excuse me. Maybe Thrive or high flow nasal oxygen is being used for pre-oxygenation for the difficult airway, but a smaller institution in the United States might not have high flow nasal oxygen and their practice might be completely different and that is perfectly fine within the context of the guidelines. We want the local institution to interpret the guidelines and use it as it's appropriate. And it's possible there may be a departure. There may be clinicians doing things outside the guidelines, outside the algorithm that are within the standards of their particular institution. And needless to say, it goes even further when we talk about clinicians in other parts of the world, we don't expect them to follow these guidelines, this, this algorithm. Combined scientific consensus. Now this is, I, I emphasized this before, the fact that the ASA guidelines are evidence-based, based upon the science. You will, in your reading, come upon guidelines from other institutions, from, from the uh, UK group, the Difficult Airway Society, from the French, the Italians, the um, uh, Canadian group, the All India group, the Puma group, the uh, Project for Universal Management of Airway. But one thing I'd like you to keep in mind is that those guidelines from these other groups are not evidence-based. They are primarily based upon opinion. The ASA guidelines are the only ones that are evidence-based. I, I think that's very important. And I think The United States, we talk about how is the sausage made? Uh, how is, you? sometimes you don't see what's happening in the factory as things are made. So I wanna tell you, how do we make these guidelines? Well, in, 19, in 2019, the whole group was invited to Schamburg, Illinois, near Chicago. And this is the ASA headquarters we see in the picture. And we were invited there for three days. And for three days, we met and we talked and we decided what were the important points we wanted to look for in the guidelines. What did we want to deal with? And we came up with something called the evidence model. And the evidence model brought together all the things that we wanted to see dealt with in the society's guidelines as it came out. So these were the, the model. The model was then given to, given to these two individuals Rick Connus and uh, Medulica, and these were our methodologists, and they went to the literature. They started doing a literature search, and they used very strict categories of evidence in their literature search, and all totaled, they developed a database that had 10,000 results. They then read the abstracts of those 10,000 results, and they found that there were 744 articles that could be accepted as 
being relevant to the evidence model, they then read the papers and they extracted data from those papers. And in the end, they found 367 papers that were acceptable as evidence. So 367 out of 10,000 papers were used to develop the guidelines and the recommendations. So this is a, a very strictly regulated process that they go through. Now, of course, everyone knows shortly after that, the world changed. And from then on, the task force was not meeting in Shamburg, Pennsylvania. We were meeting on Zoom. Now, this is very interesting because I think that Zoom, and I think that in some ways, the pandemic improved the outcome of the guidelines. So how did that happen? The typical process for doing these evidence-based guidelines is to meet, come up with the evidence base or evidence model, excuse me, then have the methodologist go through the literature, and then we would meet once again in Schamburg, Illinois, close to Chicago, and we would talk about development of the guidelines and the algorithm for about three days. But that could not happen because of the pandemic. So instead, we were, as you see here, we were meeting on Zoom. But instead of meeting for three days, we were meeting almost weekly. Sometimes we were meeting two or three times a week. And I'd say that whereas normally we would put in 35 hours to develop the guidelines, we put in over 200 hours on Zoom in order to develop these guidelines and the various algorithms. And so I think this really improved the product that came out from the ASA task force. Now we had other individuals who were helping us. This is a, a group of over 275 individuals who were our advisors and they're from around the world. And what we would do is we would come up with recommendations, send them out to this group of over 270 clinicians from around the world, and they would advise us on how our guidelines were looking. I want to introduce you to one of these individuals, and that is this guy. John Sackles. John Sackles is an emergency medicine physician. He's based in Tucson, Arizona, in the southern part of the United States. And for those of you who follow airway management on Twitter, you may know John Sackles as Airway Man. Airway Man is, uh, gives a lot of advice on Twitter. He does a lot of research on Twitter. And I want to look at Airway Man as the prototype, the model for the person in your institution who is available to you when you get into trouble and is there to help you to get out of trouble. So we're gonna keep Airway Man in mind. We're gonna come back to Airway Man later. So this process was used to develop the guidelines and I wanna talk about what's new in the ASA difficult airway guidelines and algorithmically. Now, first, we're going to start with the things that are boring, but important. They're important changes in the guidelines. The first thing is definition. So the definition of face mask ventilation and poor ventilation, historically, this was based looking at clinical signs, things like chest movement and inadequate or absent breath sounds, or maybe strider or cyanosis. It also included historically from 1991 to 2013, inadequate exhaled carbon dioxide. But if you look to the right-hand side, what we have done in the 2022 guidelines is we've elevated the importance of inadequate exhaled carbon dioxide. That is the most important factor we look for to decide if ventilation, face mask, or supraglottic airway, and in fact, all airway devices, if it's adequate. We still include, as you see here, we still include the clinical findings, but they are not considered as important as exhaled carbon dioxide. 2022, the priority is exhaled carbon dioxide. And again, it carries to, over to all forms of airway management. The definition of a difficult airway, historically it was difficulty with face mask ventilation intubation, but now we include the supraglottic airway as part of a patient who may be considered a difficult airway. Are they also 
a problem or do they have problems with supraglottic airway placement? And we also include extubation and invasive airway issues in the definition of a patient who has a difficult airway. What's the purpose of these guidelines? What's the purpose of this document? Initially, up to 2013, it was to facilitate management of the difficult airway, but now it also includes not just facilitation of management of the difficult airway, but also optimizing first attempt success rate. In addition, it recognizes, and I talked about this previously, the uniqueness of any encounter, and that is the decisions regarding airway management are dependent upon the experience, the training, the preferences of the clinician who's managing those airways, and it has to do with the context, the environment in which that person is managing that airway. The focus historically was on adults, but now it includes pediatric patients, nora, anesthesia outside the operating room, and sedation cases, regional anesthesia cases, ICU cases, and obstetric cases. So we've expanded the clinical practice that we want these guidelines to pertain to. The application historically was for anesthesia providers, but now in 2022, we want this to apply to anyone who manages airways, anesthesiologists, emergency medicine physician, ICU, paramedics outside the hospital, anyone who manages an airway, we're hoping that these guidelines pertain to and that they can use them. We did, as I said a second ago, we did expand to include pediatric. And in fact, there's a brand new algorithm and an infographic for pediatrics, but I'm not gonna talk about that, that today. My focus is gonna be on the adult patient. Okay, what's good to know? Things that are new that's good to know. Recommendations based upon interpretation of data. First of all, evaluation of the airway. We can consider advanced tools of evaluation apart from the bedside clinical exam, as well as looking at imaging in the record. Bedside preoperative endoscopy. That is, I consider the greatest experts in using a flexible scope to be anesthesiologists and maybe otolaryngologists, but we're very good at it. And what we see here is the examination of a patient before going to the operating room using a small flexible scope. And as you can see in the video we just experienced, there's a tremendous amount of information we can get from preoperative endoscopy. And then also virtual endoscopy. That is, if your facility has your, the hospital in which you practice has the facility to do this, taking reconstructions of imaging, CAT scans, MRIs, and producing a virtual endoscopy. Personally, I believe that the uh, bedside endoscopy is, gives you more information because you can, you can have a dynamically breathing patient, but virtual endoscopy has been shown to also be very helpful. What else is new? The evaluation of the patient has to be done by the clinician who's gonna manage that airway. In our situation, we have a clinic that evaluates the patient for their medical problems and also their anesthetic history and potential airway problems, and we'll make a recommendation in the patient's medical record. But it's the person who's actually going to manage the airway who must make their own evaluation and must make their own decisions regarding the airway. There's contextual factors that must be also involved in the uh, development of an airway plan, including where the patient's going to be taken care of and what has been shown in the ASA, which we talked at the very beginning about the ASA closed claims project. The closed claims project still continues. The database continues to include more and more patients. And one thing that's come out in the latest analysis of the closed claims project is that there's more airway morbidity and mortality, that is more patient morbidity and mortality in patients that are cared for in NORA. NORA stands for non-operating room anesthesia. So when you have a patient who's being cared for in a, uh, a GI clinic or an endoscopy suite or an emergency room in an ICU, the conditions are less ideal. And in the United States, at least, we see more airway morbidity 
and more airway mortality in those locations. So the location in which you're taking care of a patient becomes very important to what your decision making is. Operator experience, the availability of capable aid, that is someone to help you, and competing responsibilities. If I'm a clinician who I'm on call at two o'clock in the morning and I am seeing several patients, I have operating rooms that are being managed by my residents, operating room one, operating room two, operating room three, that may affect my decision-making regarding the airway. Maybe I decide I'm, because I have competing responsibilities, I'm gonna take a more careful approach. For example, awake intubation and taking care of a patient because I may get called away any moment. I don't, I don't wanna get called away in the middle of a, an airway problem. Preparation for difficult airway management. Um, if you evaluate that a patient is at risk, maybe a patient hasn't proven to be difficult, but you think that the patient is at risk of difficulty, you wanna assure that there's someone there to help you. You wanna inform the patient or their family that you're concerned about their airway. You wanna always give oxygen throughout the airway management period, including at extubation of the patient. So we're gonna, we're gonna give oxygen throughout. We're gonna position the patient as appropriate. If you have a patient who is anticipated that this patient is truly going to be a difficult airway, you're almost positive it's gonna be a difficult airway. The strategy of approaching that patient just depends on the context. That is, as we discussed extensively a moment ago, it depends upon where you're taking care of that patient. It depends on operator experience, the availability of capable aid, and again, competing responsibility. There is probably more than ever an emphasis on the skills of awake intubation. And even if someone does not practice awake intubation, has not practiced awake intubation in their entire life, what the AXA, their entire career, what the ASA is asking is that you know that wake intubation is one of the uh, procedures, is one of the approaches to the airway that could be taken. And if you make a decision to wake intubation, then you really should gather the resources, including, as I, I, I alluded to before, your personal airway man or airway woman who will help and, and help with that awake intubation. So perform awake intubation in the patient who's at risk of being difficult to intubate in one of the following factors difficult to ventilate, at significant aspiration risk, or at risk of rapid oxyhemoglobin desaturation. And we'll actually discuss this in detail in a few minutes. You're going to see this again. Consider combined techniques. Here's a situation where the glide scope by itself could not intubate a patient, the flexible scope by itself could not intubate a patient, but here we're combining the two, both a flexible scope and a video learning scope, a glide scope to intubate this patient. So consider the advantages of combining more than one technique. The main event, the thing that is most important to the clinician about the guidelines. And first of all, that's the difficult airway algorithm, the algorithm that clinicians in the United States and much of the world have been dependent on for the last 30 years. Here we see the uh, graphic part of the algorithm. And we see what has historically been the part of the algorithm related to evaluation. So historically, from 1991 until 2013, the evaluation part of the algorithm asked the clinician to assess the patient for possibility with difficulty with patient cooperation, difficulty with face mask ventilation, difficulty with supraglottic ventilation, such as the LMA, laryngoscopy, intubation, and the difficulty of, a, of surgical access. Also, from 1991 to 2013, they recommended actively pursuing the opportunity to give oxygen throughout the intubation process, and they considered the relative merits of awake intubation versus intubation after induction, non-invasive technique versus invasive techniques, the use of video as the first approach, 
and whether or not you should consider whether or not you should preserve the patient spontaneously breathing or make them apneic. The awake intubation versus intubation of induction, uh, intubation after the induction of general anesthesia. If you look at the most important part of the historical ASA algorithm, it is divided into two parts, awake intubation and intubation attempts after the induction of anesthesia. As I said a moment ago, many clinicians will have never done an awake intubation in their career. So why does the American Society of Anesthesiology have just two pathways, awake intubation and intubation attempts after the induction of anesthesia? I believe it's because they consider that in every single patient, it's important to ask that question. Should I be inducing anesthesia or should I keep this patient awake? You must ask the question, even if the vast majority of your patients are in this category, are in this pathway, you still have to ask the question. But on the other hand, the ASA never gave guidance as to choosing one category or another. This was a big problem. There was no guidance in choosing. So this was considered, and Dr. Salam mentioned the airway approach algorithm, which I published back in 2006. And what the airway approach algorithm does is it considers four primary inductive assessments. And each assessment should be made by the clinician managing the airway using their techniques of choice, giving available resources and what available aid is, is available to them, available to them. So if we consider two clinicians that are evaluating the same patient, which one is correct? One clinician can go to one part of the algorithm, the other clinician might go to another part of the algorithm, but whether they're correct is gonna depend upon their assessment of the patient. So let's say there's, you're evaluating the patient and you suspect there's a difficulty in video laryngoscopy or direct laryngoscopy. Now it has to be your assessment and you may decide that your primary device is video or your primary device is direct laryngoscopy, but it has to be your assessment. And you make the decision whether or not it's going to be difficult. Not impossible, but maybe just difficult, take a little extra time, it's not quite efficient, maybe you're, you're gonna need more time to interact that patient. Now, if the answer to that question is no, you can go into the induction attempts uh, intubation attempts after induction of anesthesia pathway, because you know in your heart that you have the ability to manage that patient. Now, it's possible that you could be wrong. And if you're wrong, the ASA provides the non-emergency and the emergency pathway we'll talk about in a moment. The prototypical case is rapid sequence. If you, you can do, uh, you see a patient, you decide, yes, I have the ability to intubate that patient, I'm not gonna worry about ventilation because the patient's a full stomach. So this is the prototypical case. But let's say you suspect that intubation may be a difficult, either very difficult or just a little bit difficult. You say yes to this question, and now you ask the question, do I suspect difficulty with a ventilation with a face mask or supraglottic airway? And if the answer is yes again, you've now said, and remember, you haven't touched the patient yet, you're just evaluating the patient. You've said that you've now have the potential to get into a cannot intubate, cannot ventilate situation. And this is the first patient that should be managed with a, an awake intubation. Now, if you say, no, I don't expect any difficulty with face mask ventilation, even if I have difficulty with intubation, I ask, is this patient at increased significant risk for aspiration? If the answer is yes, let's say you decide patient as an increased risk, maybe they've eaten, maybe they're diabetic, maybe they're pregnant, whatever the cause and whatever your assessment is. If the answer is yes, you've now entered a situation, remember you have not touched the patient yet, you're just evaluating the patient. You've now entered a situation where you decided the patient could be in a cannot intubate scenario and you don't want to ventilate this patient because you're at risk of aspiration. Once again, this is the patient that we recommend doing an awake intubation on. If the answer is no, we now ask the question, is it possible that if we're wrong about our assessment, this patient's gonna desaturate rapidly? 
Now, again, patient who's pregnant, the patient who has some kind of uh, intrapulmonary or intracardiac shunt, the patient who's end stage sepsis, uh, end stage malignancy, excuse me, or maybe the patient's septic, the ICU patient. If you think they're at increased risk of desaturation, you have the opportunity to mitigate your decision making. And once again, yes, we would go into the awake intubation pathway. If the answer is no, then you can go into the in intubation attempts after the induction of anesthesia pathway. So we have four inductive assessments based upon your skills and your resources that result in objective decisions, allowing you to make that choice. Provides clear operator-centered guidance. And on top of this, a post hoc rationale. You can explain why you chose one way or another. Now, in the algorithm itself, we're going to optimize oxygenation throughout. We're going to limit our attempts, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. We want to limit attempts. I guess we'll talk about it now. Because what we know from the literature now is that after three or four attempts at intubation or ventilation with supraglottic airway, after three or four attempts, it's unlikely the fifth and sixth attempts are going to be successful, but we're introducing trauma into the airway that may degrade our ability to face mass ventilate. And there's now good literature dating back from the early 2000s that supports that thesis, that we don't want to keep going with our attempts at intubation and supraglottic ventilation. We're going to call for help. We're, we've eliminated the idea of waking up the patient. And the reason we've eliminated this is it's wonderful if the patient does wake up and start to breathe again, but we don't want clinicians to focus on that. We want them to keep taking care of the patient. The patient wakes up, that's fine. If we go to face mask ventilation, we confirm by CO2, we're going to limit our attempts and consider waking the patient up. But if we get into a situation where we, we cannot intubate or we cannot ventilate with a supraglottic airway, we're going to be um, in the emergency pathway. We're going to limit our attempts and eventually we will go for an invasive airway. Again, we don't want to depend upon waking up the patient. Now, what's new in, and, and I think exciting in the ASA guidelines? It's the idea of bringing together evidence and the expert opinion of this group and our consultants. And that wound up developing something called the infographic. So the infographic is a, a new tool that is being used by the ASA and I'm more and more by groups in the United States. You know, we had the 1993 algorithm. In 2003, we added the LMA, the uh, video laryngoscopy. And in 2022, we developed the new ASA algorithm. We've gone over some of it uh, a moment ago, but there are some fundamental problems with the ASA algorithm that have lived with us, with us since 1993. That is, as we talked about before, we don't have we did not historically have guidance for going into the two pathways, pathway B, pathway A, but that has been resolved now with the addition of the decision tree tool that we've discussed in detail. Now, this is a problem that the ASA algorithm begins with attempts at intubation, but we don't intubate all patients, and we're gonna resolve that in the infographic. These are rigid pathways. The idea of limiting attempts is vague, some people have complained that this pathway is complicated. And also, if we fail awake intubation, what's our next step? So as I alluded to before, the ASA went to resolve these with the development of the infographic. Now, the infographic is a three-part or three-panel diagram that exists in the ASA guidelines next to the ASA algorithm. And it consists of three parts, the decision tree that we talked about, the awake intubation pathway, and the pathway for management after the induction of anesthesia. Now we've talked about the, uh, this pathway, that is the decision tree tool. So I'm going to try and skip over that, okay? And 
I'm gonna to jump to look at the two pathways. So the first pathway that we might consider, we, we already went through the decision tree tool, is the awake intubation pathway. So let's take a detail at look at this. The first thing we recommend is that the entire team in the operating room review the airway strategy for this awake intubation. And we already talked about who gets an awake intubation. You can choose an awake technique, or you could potentially choose an elective invasive airway. Let's say you don't have the resources or the skill or the experience to do an awake intubation. Another possibility in a serious situation is to do an elective surgical airway. That is a possibility. Success is confirmed by adequate ventilation. That is the detection of CO2. And hopefully you're successful in your awake intubation but you may not be successful. There'll be a certain number that will fail to establish awake intubation. You should consider calling for help at this time. You don't have to call for help because your patient's awake and breathing and it's not an emergency. But then we have what I think is a great addition from the ASA, this, this revision, is the awake non-emergency pathway. And I think this is a tremendous addition to the guidelines. Now, what are our various options if we fail awake intubation? The first one is to postpone the case and consider the risk and benefits of, first of all, using a different technique. Let's say you started with a flexible scope. Well, you can continue your awake intubation using a different technique, like a video laryngoscope, or maybe a retrograde intubation. You can call your expert, airway man, to come help you. Or, as we talked about a moment ago, you could consider an awake surgical airway. You know, let's say you have a patient with a subdural hematoma, but the patient's also a difficult airway. And so you try an awake intubation, it fails, but the subdural hematoma has to be taken care of. So an awake surgical airway is a potential. You could consider a different anesthetic technique. Let's say this is a patient who's for a surgery that could involve a regional anesthetic. They just happen to have a difficult airway. Well, maybe your expert is not an airway person. Maybe they're a regional person. And maybe they could come and help you with a regional anesthetic. And lastly, there is the possibility in an emergency to go ahead and induce anesthesia and go into the third panel, which we're about to discuss but we're gonna have a surgical team available immediately to do a surgical airway. So these are the possibilities if you fail awake intubation. Now, we'll talk about what I think is the most important innovation, and that is part three. And again, part three of the infographic is based upon the evidence and the expert opinion of our group. So in part three, three, which is airway management of the induction of anesthesia, we're gonna once again review our strategy with our team, and we're gonna talk about the anatomic risk, the physiologic risk, the equipment and monitoring we plan to use, and what our airway plan is. And then we're gonna pre oxygenate the patient as we do with every patient, and we'll do Certainly, it means induction of general anesthesia. But in addition, induction of regional anesthesia and even induction of sedation. So historically, the ASA algorithm focused on the induction of general anesthesia. But we as clinicians do more than that. We induce regional anesthesia, we induce spinals, we induce epidural, we even induce sedation. So the infographic I'm going to show you deals with all sorts of anesthesia, whereas the ASA algorithm only dealt with general anesthesia. We're gonna deliver and optimize oxygenation throughout the airway management. And we'll ask the question, is our airway plan successful? Now, once again, I wanna talk about the ASA algorithm, the other diagram we just looked at. That dealt with the patient who you were trying to intubate. The infographic that you're looking at here deals with the patient who you might use a tracheal tube, an LMA, or an IGEL, or whatever your 
superglottic airway is, a face mask, and even a patient who just has a nasal cannula, and you can even argue the patient who has none of this. So this new algorithm, this new infographic deals with all these patients. You are a professional and you're gonna have an airway plan and you'll decide if that airway plan is successful. If it's successful, you continue with your plan that you made as a professional. If your airway plan is not successful, you ask the question, is ventilation adequate? Now, what's ventilation? The definition of ventilation is removal of CO2. So we ask in all cases that when possible, we measure CO2. Detection of CO2 is equivalent to removal of CO2 from the alveolus, which equals gas exchange oxygen for carbon dioxide. So let's say you have a pulmonary capillary and CO2 is being brought from the periphery to your lung, to your alveolus. And we can detect CO2 with end tidal CO2 monitoring. But if obstruction should occur, your end tidal CO2 monitoring stops immediately and you know that your airway is not patent. Let's look, why, why not look at oxygenation, which is historically we looked at oxygenation. The problem with oxygenation, it's too late a sign. That is, you have hemoglobin that's getting saturated with oxygen. And if your airway gets obstructed, you lose patency, you'll still have oxidation for some time before you realize that you've lost the airway. So in the ASA algorithm, we emphasize you have to look at capnography. The goal of airway management is indeed oxygenation, keeping your patient supported and physiologic support. But the process of airway management is establishing that patency, and that's measured with end tidal CO2. Now, we also ask the question, adequate ventilation. What is adequate ventilation? Well, ventilation is very objective, end tidal CO2, but adequacy is a clinical judgment, and that's where your clinical expertise come in. So let's say the ventilation is adequate. You enter in the non-emergency pathway. The goal is now going to be to secure the airway, and if adequate ventilation is not true, you're in the emergency pathway and you're gonna call for help and the goal is going to be establish ventilation. Just get your CO2 uh, detection back. In the, in the, in the non-emergency pathway, we can consider alternative devices. Let's say you use video laryngoscopy, now you use direct laryngoscopy or the other way around. You could use a flexible combined techniques, superglottic airways, different adjuncts to help you with ventilation, introducers, stylets. We want to limit our attempts to three attempts because we know about this plateau effect that I discussed in detail before, that after three attempts, it's unlikely that a four, five, and six attempts will be successful. And there's some good evidence for this, but it's mostly expert opinion. And then one more attempt by your personal airway expert. Why limit attempts? Because at, with each attempt, you're producing trauma, which could degrade your ability to ventilate that patient. You want to assess the ventilation between every attempt. Keep asking the important question, is ventilation adequate? And if the answer is no, you'll find yourself in the emergency pathway. We never want to be there. You could awaken the patient, do an awake intubation, postpone the case, consider regional anesthesia, and even consider an elective surgical airway. Or another possibility is with the patient awake or asleep, doing a surgical airway under controlled conditions because you are in a stable situation with an experienced operator, experienced surgeon. Now let's look at the emergency pathway. In the emergency pathway, where the goal is to establish ventilation, get that CO2 curve going again. And we're gonna do that by rotating through the core techniques. That is laryngoscopy intubation, use of a superglottic airway or use of a face mask. Now this is probably the most important point I can make. The next attempt cannot be dictated by an algorithm, but it has to be dictated by your experience, the context in where you're, you're 
operating, including who's there to help you and your available equipment and what you do next in a failed airway in the emergency pathway is informed by your prior attempts. Again, the next attempt is informed by your prior attempts. And every time you make an attempt, you're learning more and more about the airway and learning what to do next. So let's say you do direct laryngoscopy and you have a poor view of the larynx. The next attempt might be with a bougie or it might be with a different technique altogether. Video laryngoscopy, if you tried direct laryngoscopy the first time. Let's say you have difficult face mask ventilation. So of course you put in an oral airway, but let's say the problem is the facial hair. That's preventing you from getting a seal. So maybe you switch to a, a superglottic airway. Maybe that superglottic airway is not adequate. So you change the superglottic airway to a different type, a different size, a different generation. The next attempt is going to be informed by prior attempts. And each attempt will focus closer and closer on the problem in that patient. But too many attempts risk creating new problems. You may cause trauma to the airway, but also you're eating up the oxygen and you're getting closer to an emergency because the oxygen is being removed from the alveolus. We're going to once again limit ourselves to three attempts at managing this airway with one more attempt by our expert. We're going to optimize every attempt. We'll do what we can to make intubation better every attempt, including using muscle relaxants. We will do whatever we can to make face mask ventilation better. And once again, we may make changes to make superglottic ventilation better. We won't avoid We want to stay aware of the oxygen saturation. We want to stay aware of the amount of time passage and the number of attempts that we've taken and then yield to the emergency invasive airway pathway. So we're gonna stay aware. Assess the ventilation. Every single attempt you wanna assess ventilation, ask the question, is ventilation adequate? And if the answer is no, we're gonna go into the invasive airway pathway. That includes rigid bronchoscopy and potentially ECMO. If ventilation is restored, we're now back to the non-emergency pathway and you, will you're an advantage you can oxygenate the patient ventilate the patient but you have to be aware you can always fall back into the emergency pathway that can always happen so this is the the infographic um the innovations are its clear and defensible decisions ventilation determines your success and flexibility is based upon the individual operator thank you I, I hope you've enjoyed the changes to the ASA guidelines, and I especially hope you appreciate what's been done now in the ASA um, infograph. Thank you. Thank you so very much, uh, Professor William Rosenblatt. Uh, we are really glad that you gave an insight on different techniques and you know some of the updates, and even I have a few uh, queries. But before I come and jump onto my questions, I would like the participants to ask questions. And uh, before, and I would be reading one or two of the comments from the chat box, and then the discussion is open for all to, uh, you know, uh, for everyone. So uh, Razia Hussain Khamusi has asked why no rapid sequence intubation in the first place for every patient when there is an exception of uh, contraindication with the exception of contraindication to succinethonia. So she's just asking that in case of difficult airway, why, uh, why not uh, the rapid sequence in the first instance? So that's not only is that a very interesting question, but you may know the name of Richard Levitan um, here in the United States, who's done a lot of uh, writing about emergency medicine and difficult airway management. And I just spoke to Richard on the phone uh, last night. So, uh, and, and this was part of the, one of the questions he had, which was very interesting. So rapid sequence induction, um, well, first, first of all, succinylcholine. My personal feelings that succinylcholine should be eliminated. 
except for very, very rare circumstances. There are so many complications with succinylcholine, with uh, muscle uh, uh, myalgias, with the increase in potassium, increase uh, CO2, increase uh, acid uh, base balance. There's um, increased interthoracic pressure, inter uh, cranial pressure, and so forth. And we have now, you know, rock coronium, which makes the airway, and vecuronium, which makes the airway better. So the first thing is, I think that uh, we shouldn't be using succinylcholine at all. We have these other, we've had these other medications. You know, rapid sequence is done certainly in a patient who has at risk of aspiration and in other, in other situations, but I think there's an advantage to, of slowly taking care of an airway, of not rushing what you do, you know, inducing anesthesia. I, of course, give muscle relaxants with my hypnotic agent, but I want to slowly get my patient to a level of anesthesia where I can hemodynamically and carefully manage that airway. So possibly in emergency medicine, possibly at risk of aspiration patients doing uh, rapid sequence in all patients. As far as difficult airway patients, there's certainly, you would not want to do a rapid sequence with a patient who's at risk of a, um, of a difficult intubation and a difficult ventilation, right? So I think that your question related to all patients, and that's how I feel about all patients, but certainly in a patient who's at risk of difficult intubation and ventilation, I, I wouldn't do a rapid sequence. Emergency medicine may be different. All right. Thank you so much. You have already answered the question which I had in mind. And there is another question from Kule Godwin. He is asking about whether to intubate deep or awake. So this is another question. And then I'll come to my question then. And then, I'm sorry, deep or awake in what situation? Um, uh, Dr. Kule, can you please elaborate on your uh, question, please? On your query, which you want to ask from Dr. Rosenblatt? Oh, sorry, I was meaning extubation, not, not intubation, sorry. Um, can, you, can you please repeat your question, please? Yes, like uh, when to intubate, rather when to extubate, uh, deep or extubating awake? Because... Oh, so the question's about extubation. Oh, okay, that's a very good question. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. So a, a lot of clinicians in the United States uh, did not believe in deep extubation. I'm in agreement with you. I like it. I like deep extubation, and I and I often do it. Um, I think that if I have a patient who has had airway surgery, um, and especially if they, if at the beginning of the case they were difficult, and then they had a, a airway surgery, um, I have some concerns, and I I won't do a deep extubation. But for the average patient and for the average difficult airway patient who maybe has bowel surgery or maybe has extremity surgery, I, I'm in agreement with you. I like deep extubation. If it's the patient who's had you know, surgery on the head and neck, I will often, I will most often make sure they're awake, breathing well. And you know, we have um, you know, with things like uh, Remy fentanyl infusions and other techniques for keeping the patient from, from coughing. You can get a patient, and dexmedetomidine, you can get a patient very awake and very calm for the extubation. So if I have a patient with airway surgery, I, I wanna make sure that they're awake and breathing, but I'll use drugs such as dexmedetomidine, remifentanil to smooth my extubation. Uh, all right, thank you. So, uh, Dr. Uh, William, I have one query regarding the initial uh, definition which you gave about difficult intubation in which you had mentioned a difficult extubation. So, I just was, I was wondering that what made you and the task force to include difficult extubation in the criteria of uh, difficult intubation? Because, you know, there are other patients who are difficult to extubate because of the other reasons related to their uh, respiratory tract. Uh, and um, there are other uh, uh, surgeries which 
de de redeem de those patients not to extubate. So in those kinds of patients, how can we say that it would, and despite of the fact that the patient was not uh, difficult to intubate, so how can we include them in difficult intubation criteria when you say? Very interesting. So the, the task force as a group um, was looking at the evidence-based literature. And what has been found, especially in the closed claims project, is that there are in, 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 our, in our database, there's fewer and fewer patients who have had morbid events or, more, or mortal events and intubation, and we're seeing more and more problems at extubation. So from 1991 to now, we see more problems at extubation. And the feeling was that the ASA guidelines and the guidelines from other organizations have done a pretty good job at helping with intubation of a, 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 you know, and the, the start of an anesthetic, but have not done as good a job at helping with extubation. So there was more of an emphasis on extubation. So, you know, as, as you alluded to, Dr. Salam, there may be patients who are not difficult intubations, and we wanted clinicians to now be aware and think about the extubation process. So it was more than anything else, it was trying to get clinicians to be aware of the problems at extubation. All right, and um, as you have uh, mentioned about the glidoscope and the video laryngoscope, so I just want to give you a little uh, know-how about Pakistan uh, situation, which is that most of the tertiary care hospitals in the urban cities and the larger cities, they have a certain kind of, uh, you know, equipments for difficult intubation like video laryngoscope and the fiber optic scope and uh, endoscope and, you know, other stuff. But uh, there are many institutions in other parts and even in the larger cities as well, which do not have glidoscope and you know video laryngoscope so in the end uh, most of the institute and most of the anesthesiologists where they are working independently privately or you know without an institution giving the anesthesia as a private person so they rely on uh, either their technique their experience or uh, succinylcholine for that matter of fact because they are, they don't have those glidoscope and you know the fancy equipments which the rest of the people may have may be having so in that scenario we don't have any algorithm for you know difficult intubation except for the fact that just try to maintain the oxygenation and capnography and you know maintain the oxygen with either with an airway or with a nasal airway, oral airway, or an LMA. That's what? the basic and the minimum criteria which one can have here in our country. So I think that the, the guidelines and the infographics deal with that very well. And what they say is that you have to make decisions based upon your resources. And if you're in a high resource hospital or a low resource hospital, the decision and the the and which pathway you choose is going to be based based upon that and your personal experience. So, for example, you know I could see a patient with my resident with a resident with a registrar, and I may say to the registrar, this patient is an easy intubation because I have my glide scope and I have experience. But my registrar might, if I'm not there, my registrar mm -hmm. might say. You know, I don't have access to a glide scope or I don't feel confident in my glide scope abilities. So I'm going to go with a different pathway, awake intubation. So really the info, the infographic that we talked about, every decision is made based upon your experience and your, and, and your resources mm -hmm. and your resources. You know, it doesn't have to be equipment. Let's say you're practicing where you're the only anesthesiologist, where in another institution, there are several people like airway men you can call upon. You have to make that decision based upon where you're practicing and how you practice. 
That's such an important point, Dr. William, because, you know, that's that I think that's the key message which uh, anyone from our country can get that whatever the expertise one have or the other personnel having that expertise, just call them and uh, uh, like, you know, call for help. And at the right time, you know, the right decision at the right time makes the difference. So I think this is the key message. And uh, there are some certain other questions from, uh, you know, one of our participants, Razia, has uh, not only raised her hand, but also unmuted. So Razia, can you please just ask the question from Professor William as you have raised your hand? Thank you. I think, you, I think you're muted. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you for the excellent presentation. Actually, whatever doctor mentioned in that uh, context only, I asked the question about rapid sequence induction because most of our private hospitals do not have capnography. Uh, and, uh, Esther, where do you work? Sorry, I'm just interrupting your question. Where do you exactly work? Yeah, I've been working in Karachi for the last uh, past 30 years. And yes. uh, uh, so, uh, is the, is your uh, hospital a tertiary care hospital or a small hospital? Just for uh, just for that. Yeah, I've been working in both uh, academic institute as well as private hospitals. So I have uh, uh, quite a good know how about uh, the limitations of expertise and the gadgetry and um, the other limitations as well. That's the. Uh, the assistance that we get is not that good. That's why I placed the question of rapid sequence induction. In that, uh, in our scenarios, uh, what uh, I have uh, experienced in my past practice, I feel that rapid sequence induction uh, would uh, be the first choice, uh, especially because we do not have the sophisticated rela muscle relaxants also one thing and uh, people do not uh, they are not available easy so the drugs are not available capnography monitoring expertise assistance adding all this up together um, then we have to then the this uh, the new algorithm which you presented I, I liked it because it is not that watertight and that's so, how, where we can accommodate uh, uh, it in any institute and make our own algorithms based on this. So Dr. Azia, just a quick query uh, if you can answer uh, because to my understanding uh, every uh, tertiary care hospital has got the capnograph so that's quite a news for me that you don't have any uh, capnography at your institute. No, uh, uh, presently I'm not uh, in an institute, I have retired but oh, okay. uh, in all these long years of practice for many, many uh, long years we did not have capnography. Oh, that okay. was a long time back. I think yeah. for the past right. 10 years, and it has been... in private been, hospitals, uh, yeah. still capnography is not there. No, I, I agree completely. And in some ways, guidelines like this have to be aspirational because um, they kind of say, this is where the science is and we, we all have to move towards that science. I'll give you an example. There's a, there's a group in the UK uh, called Lifebox. And for about 10 years, Lifebox pushed for oxygen uh, uh, saturation monitoring worldwide. And they raised a lot of money, primarily on the African continent, they raised money for getting oxygen saturation monitors into hospitals and clinics. And now that's, and they did that. They were successful in many parts of the African continent. And now they are concentrating on capnography. So they're raising money to get capnography into these uh, rural areas on the African continent. And that is just an example how we can kind of set an aspirational goal and then try and move that way. But we, we have to set those goals. But you are absolutely correct that what we're trying to emphasize in the new guidelines and especially the infographic is that you have to do it based upon what you have available to you. So I agree, absolutely agree, absolutely agree. Thank you. Thanks for that. Thank comment. you so much, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Azia, for asking the important question. And we have very interesting question by uh, Rahman. 
and he's asking is there any role of robotic intubation or commercially available intubation what is the role of ai in difficult airway so even though that does not uh, you know apply on our setup but yes definitely from the perspective of uh, the american society can you please answer this interesting question Absolutely. So I know I'm aware of at least three groups that are working on robotic intubation and uh, one in California, one in Texas and one in Israel. And um, it is, is definitely um, a thing that is happening. Um, it, I don't think that these groups yet have decided where those are going to be best applicable. But, but just to let you know that it is being worked on. And, and each one of these groups is using a different technique for teaching the AI how to find the airway. I mean, of course, these are right now very sophisticated devices, but some of these groups are working on very portable devices. It may be not something you'll see in a hospital, but maybe you'll see it someday in an ambulance, you know, with a poorly trained technician who's using robotic intubation that's guided by an anesthesiologist back in the hospital. So, you know, um, hang tight and, uh, and it is something that we're looking at. Very interesting question. Yeah, it is, it is. So there are two more questions. If we can ask if you have some time, Dr. William. I have, because, on, you know, on the okay. hour, I have another uh, conference on the hour, but I do, but I have a little time. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, okay, so we, uh, a little, a little, Review from the chat box. Is there any criteria for the pre-op endoscopy, laryngoscopy for difficult intubation? And there was another one, if you can uh, answer both at the same time. How do you prepare your patients for awake fiber optic intubation? Are you are you using the traditional blocks? Okay, very interesting. Well, first of all, when you do preoperative endoscopy, it's really not much of a block. It's a little uh, vasoconstrictor in the nose and then a little bit of local anesthetic in the nose. And when we take a look with an endoscope, there are criteria. We look for three things. One, is there a straight, direct uh, pathway to the larynx? That's number one. Number two, is there anything that would interfere with your ability to use a superglottic airway to, um, uh, to ventilate that patient if you had difficulty with intubation? And then number three, is there any anterior structure which would be damaged by use of a bladed instrument like a direct laryngoscope or a glide scope? If any one of those three things are positive, that will push you towards doing a awake intubation. Now, the second question is more difficult because, first of all, I, I, don't, I do not use needle blocks anymore. I haven't used needle blocks for about two decades. I only use topical blocks. So. Um, and I would answer your question, but the problem is that it's not a quick answer. It's a, it's a, it's a, a, a significant lecture. It takes about a half hour. And um, I would be, Dr. Salam, I'd be happy to share that lecture on video or give it to the, the organization live if you desired. But certainly I would be happy to give you a, um, a link to a video that describes in detail the technique I use for awake intubation. I'd be very happy to do that. We will be so grateful, Dr. William, and I'm really grateful to you. We have the president of uh, Pakistan Society of Anesthesiologists, Dr. Amin Khwaja, with us uh, for the concluding remarks. And I'm really grateful to you for coming online, giving us such an insight about the difficult airway. Um, uh, we would like to have you online again with us sometime soon or maybe later this year, if you have time for us. Thank you, Dr. William. Uh, for sparing time and uh, thank you all the participants to be here. Um, uh, uh, we are really grateful for uh, updating us with the latest guidelines. And uh, as you said, extubation is as important as the intubation. That is very important thing. So that has to be highlighted because just to intubate is not enough, but it is much more important to focus on the extubation. And uh, once again, doctor, thank you very much. And we are looking forward to get your new lectures and updates on in our in, in our forum. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. And I would request everyone to kindly fill in the feedback form so that the e-certificate can be given to you. The link is given in the chat box. Uh, Dr. William, we will be sharing the feedback with you along with the certificate very soon. Thank you. It's so long.
Thank you. Take care. Bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. My honor.